So, einen wunderschönen guten Abend. I would say if we would be speaking in German, which we are obviously not today, um, we are greeting you from four different locations, two of them in Germany, which is me in Nuremberg and Martin in Köln, is it? Köln? Yes. Yes. And we're also here from Canada. Uh, Steve is joining us from Canada, from Vancouver. Yes, and yep. Nino is here from London or near London. So you can imagine how global Expolingua is. And I think this time the online event is <clears throat> at least as cool as the Berlin event, event always was. So we are going to introduce ourselves briefly so that you know who we are. And then we have a very interesting discussion ahead of us which I will speak about a little later. So I'm your host today. My name is Maria and I'm a YouTuber or an EduTuber as we call ourselves to separate ourselves from the YouTubers who do kitten videos and gaming videos. So we do education, serious stuff on YouTube. And uh, I teach German for advanced learners. I also have an online language school where I basically do the same. And I have three wonderful guests today. And um, I'm not sure how to start. I guess we stick with the old fashioned ladies first. And <laughs> we start with Minu. Minu, tell us a little about yourself, please, or the Thank audience. You. Okay, thank you very much, Maria. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to this chat show. And uh, my name is Minu. I am originally from Iran. So I'm Iranian but I teach, I live in England and I teach English. I've been teaching English for almost 40 years. So that's the only thing I've ever done wow. in my life, <laughs> in my professional life. And I have a YouTube channel called AngloLink where I teach English. And I also have my own website where I have my full complete English course. I've been taught English in schools, in residential settings, but for the past 10 years, mainly online. That's all about me. Thank you so much, Minu. So guys, now I have to <laughs> decide. Um, Steve, would you go next? Okay, so I'm uh, Steve Kaufman. I'm here in Vancouver, Canada. Uh, I am uh, passionate about learning languages. Uh, for most of my career, I was in the wood business, the international trade of wood products. But the last 15 years, I've been more involved with language uh, learning. And also, together with my son, we set up a language learning platform called Link, L-I-N-G-Q dot com, which is where I learn languages. Uh, right now, I'm learning Arabic and Farsi. Zabon ho, Farsi yod nigidam. Heli dustra. And I have a YouTube channel called Lingo Steve, uh, um, where I, I wouldn't call myself an educator per se, but I, I, mo I, I hope to motivate people to learn languages and I speak in different languages. And uh, so I'm very interested in this whole community of people who are using the internet to connect with language learners and, and motivate more people to learn languages. Wonderful. Thank you, Steve. I, it was actually a surprise to know about the wood business. I didn't know that but it's definitely exciting in the combination with the languages. So very happy to have you here. I guess we have different perspectives on language learning, which will make it definitely interesting. Martin, please tell yes. us who you are. <laughs> well, my name is Martin. I come from Peru. Um, I'm not a language teacher. I'm not a polyglot, even though I speak four languages, but one of the languages is Portuguese and Portuguese and Spanish are almost the same language. <laughs> I think so. Um, yes. Yes, says Steve. Um, I have a YouTube channel and a podcast where I talk about my expat experience in Germany. So uh, my community is, uh, they, they are Latin American people who uh, live in Germany or or who want to live in Germany, the name of the channel is El Jardín de Martín, uh, I mean, Martin's Garden. And yes, something interesting is 
before my 30s, I couldn't speak a second language, right? I, I didn't study English at, at the school. Um, I started with English when I was 30, uh, 34 German, 36 uh, Portuguese, and now I'm trying to learn a bit of French. And yeah. Thank you, Martin. And I think your perspective is also very interesting for our discussion today, because we plan to discuss something that does not really exist, but imagine a situation, <laughs> a world where all methodology of learning and teaching foreign languages has gone. Overnight, no one has an idea how to teach or learn languages. So there are different languages, but how to deal with them, no one knows, which means all the inefficient old structures are gone, which is good, but all the good structures are also gone. So why are we are here today? We are here to find out which strategies, which methods should be implied, uh, should be applied in the whole world. So it's up to us to decide. Feel the responsibility, dear colleagues, and um, yes, I will be moderating and um, I'm very curious to hear your ideas about that. Just ready when you are, if you have an idea, what should be one of the most important things to do? Right, I'll go first. I think uh, listen, 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 immerse yourself in the language, relax and immerse yourself in the language. I think that's really important. Uh, without really uh, setting the intention, I want to learn this language, more setting the intention, I want to love this language, get into kind of tune my ears into this language. So feelings first, I would say. I don't know. I... Gentlemen, what do you think? <laughs> Uh, yes, um, I, I agree with you because from my perspective, um, when you try to learn a language as an adult person, not, not as a kid or as a teenager, you, you don't know how to start, right? And the first idea that you have is, okay, I'm going to study English or German or Portuguese uh, like geography or history or math. And that's a huge mistake. Um, I think, uh, just from my experience, is th there is just one way to learn the language and it is emotional, not, not ra rational, right? That, that's just one idea. And you talked about uh, listen. Um, today, I I don't spend uh, more time like trying to learn grammar. I'm just all the time listening interviews, podcasts, trying to watch films. And in my case, I don't know if that works in all the cases, but in my case, listen and read. I think is that that's the same uh, opinion of of Steve. I don't know, but uh, I think listen and read and just use the language, not to study the language, use the language is the best way to connect connect uh, with, with the language, right? Yeah, I mean, I, I certainly agree with, sorry. No, 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 I was just, I just uh, yeah. yeah, I agree, yes. I, I agree with Manu and I agree with Martin uh, I mean, before there were language schools, there were lots of people who spoke many different languages. Uh, there used to be far more languages than there are today. Uh, we can see that if we go to the Brazilian jungle. Somehow, people who speak different languages managed to learn each other's language. And they did it without schools. So they did it, I think, listening. They weren't able to read, perhaps, you know, before the invention of writing. Uh, but they had to get the language in them. And I, I have said... Uh, I recently tweeted on this. Uh, in order to learn a language, you first have to get to know the language. Uh, if you have a lot of grammatical explanations, I apologize for the phone. 
uh, a lot of grammatical explanations, a lot of instructions about something that the learner has no familiarity with. It's very difficult. It's very mm. difficult to make sense of these grammatical explanations. You can't sort of, in anticipation, say, we're about to teach you this language and here's how it goes. It's subject, verb, object, or it's this or it's that. It makes no impression on us. If we have had a lot of exposure to the language, we, which we can do, where we focus on comprehension and don't worry too much about the structure, we get used to language. Now we can introduce some ideas, uh, some things that we maybe didn't notice or some things that help us figure out how the language works. So, no. so I agree with the two previous uh, commentators. It's not a discussion if we all agree on everything. I, I, I know. Well, we're, we're talking <laughs> about this I guess I, I should become more provoking. You know, I will mm. ask provoking questions. So I heard that in the past um, there were teachers who were teaching languages and they were not actually fluent in the language, or maybe they didn't have a passion for the language, but mm. they had learned how to teach this language. So as well, it's it's now in the past, but if we now think about new strategies, what do you think would be the qualities of the teachers of the new generation? So what is crucial? Not the methodology, mm. but maybe something else. So what do you think? Hmm. Uh, I have maybe a, a really good example. Uh, I compare always a language learning process with uh, photography. Because we, because my profession is a photograph and a filmmaker. Uh, well, filmmaker sounds uh, maybe weird, but that, that's the name for my uh, profession. And when you want to learn photography, you have two options. Just go to the street and try to use the camera on or before try to read the manual, know the rules, and then go to the street with the camera. Um, there are a lot of people who want to learn all the rules and the grammar and then go, go with the camera and take pictures, but the reality or, or the true, uh, just, is just from my perspective is, it is much more important try to use the camera, enjoy the camera, know others, uh, uh, photographers, know people who is inspire you, or I mean, uh, uh, enter to this uh, photography world. And then when you need the rules, you can read the manual and try to apply the rules to your work. And I don't know, what do you think about this, um, this um, difference, I mean, grammar and practical learning? I think, uh, in my opinion, it's, uh, they're intertwined. So I feel that, first of all, they need to listen, get into the language, get the feel for it, begin to like it. So there has to be some emotional connection with the language first. And then gradually, I think when that emotional connection exists, they become curious to know about the grammar, about the pronunciation, and there they can explore. So I think it's an interplay of being exposed, being listening, just soaking it in, and then thinking, oh yeah, well, why is it like that? What is the structure here? How is it different from my language? So for me, it's just like that. Motivation, feeling, curiosity, when the questions appear in their mind about grammar, about pronunciation, then they go and discover it rather than cramming, like Steve was saying, cramming from the beginning with all these abstract ideas that they're not even interested in, there's no feeling of curiosity, it just puts them off. And I think, unfortunately, thankfully, now those methods have gone out the door. Thank you, Maria. <laughs> and now we're starting again. So let's get them connected with the language first before they want to know more. Because I teach a lot of grammar but I'm hoping that I'm teaching grammar to only those who want to know about it. That's, that's my hope. Well, you know, I have to agree with uh, Minu entirely. Uh, and of course the question is, so what is the role? If we have this new revolutionary way of teaching languages, then how does it work and what's the role of the teacher? 
And I think the role of the teacher is exactly what Minou said. First and foremost, how can you motivate the student? Because if you can't motivate the student, you, you're not going to have much success. And if you can help create this emotional connection to the language, everything else becomes much easier. So there, first of all, finding some kind of learning content, whether it be audio or books or movies or whatever, something that inspires mm -hmm. the learner in some way. And uh, so that's, and, and then to sort of ration the grammatical explanations, be sort of sensitive to the curiosity that each learner has to different aspects of the language and, and provide those explanations uh, you know at an appropriate time which is as Minu said when they're curious because obviously when we're curious about something we're more likely to remember it more likely to understand it because we want to understand it um, where traditionally the teacher says today we're going to we're going to do the subjunctive and at the end of the class we're going to test you on the subjunctive because I decided I'm going to teach you the subjunctive and the student may have zero interest in the subjunctive and in fact, may never even have noticed that the subjunctive existed. But when the student starts to notice that there is this thing called the subjunctive, then there's an opportunity for the teacher to go in and provide additional explanation. So I think the role of the teacher has to be motivator, guide, and, and has to be very astute at, at basically, mm -hmm. uh, you know, administering appropriate amounts of grammar or help on pronunciation, whatever. But even help on the pronunciation can only come after a lot of listening because you can't pronounce what you can't hear. So you mm. have to begin by hearing a lot of the language. So I'm, mm. I, I would attend, you know, I'm learning Farsi. I should get online with Minou to work on my Farsi. But she's probably <laughs> forgotten Farsi because she teaches English now. Oh, no, I haven't forgotten it. I can't write it, I have to say, but I can speak yes. it. So I'll be your conversation partner, Steve. Oh, that'd be phenomenal. <laughs> okay, I, I like using the phrase, uh, the teachers should not answer questions that uh, have not been asked, which is basically what happens in any language classroom. So mm -hmm. the teacher enters and says, well, in, in the past, you know, in the old uh, world. So uh, the teacher enters the classroom and says, okay, today, today we're gonna talk about passive voice. The students have no idea what it's for, and uh, of course, they have no motivation. So this is what my classroom English uh, looked like. It was horrible. And my teacher spoke English like, today we are going to speak English. And then my ears fell <laughs> off, even though I couldn't speak English yet, but they were already falling off. So my idea is, especially if we speak about children or teenagers, I would not teach language as such. I would mix native speakers and uh, children or, or young people who want to learn the language and I would give them projects. I would give them something that they can work on together and they would um, come to the idea that they have to deal with the language and they will need some grammar structures, for example, and then they will come up to the teacher and say, look, how can I express uh, something yes. that has not happened yet? And then I answer the question that mm -hmm. has been asked, but only then. What do you think about such idea? Yeah, that sounds good. Like you were saying, yeah, they, they, they want to know, they will learn it. If they don't want to know, they'll never learn it. And I think like Martin was saying, it's uh, teaching is not the right word for languages because language is not a subject language is a, is a tool so it's like uh, and therefore we we have to change the vocabulary as well mm -hmm. so like you're saying i think we need to coach guide mm, create a space where they can explore the language and we're there to help them guide them answer their questions yeah i think maria wants us to disagree with her so there's a debate but we're all <laughs> agreeing on everything yeah <laughs> okay. Well, I won't disagree with Maria, but um, I think we can we can do we can go quite a ways without without understanding the grammar. That's an important point. Like if you take Russian, which I gather, judging by her accent, that she imitated, that uh, she's uh, of Russian origin, uh, and uh, of course, Russian ha is notorious for having very complicated grammar. 
Uh, but you know, you can enjoy, I enjoyed the language. I spent six months to a year reading Tolstoy and it was never quite clear if it was the instrumental case or if it was the uh, dative case or whatever case, but usually language is so redundant in terms of the amount of words that are there. <clears throat> you can kind of figure it out and then gradually you become curious. And then you say, no, I got to really nail that down. But like my um, emphasis in language learning is always comprehension first. So when it comes to comprehension, you know, fuzzy grammar, not knowing whether it's the subjunctive or the passive, whatever. There are enough words there that you can understand it and enjoy the language. And if you do a lot of reading and listening, the language kind of, you know, coming into your brain. And then the teacher points out, oh, by the way, you know that uh, this case is used in this way and these are the endings. Oh, yeah, I kind of noticed that. So I think that I think we should accept the fact that for, for a good while, as people start into a language, if it's focused on vocabulary acquisition and comprehension, we don't need to put so much emphasis on the grammar. I, I just throw, put that out there as a suggestion. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know how, when when I see my own experience. Um, I realized that kids and teenagers here in Germany, they learn the German language really fast. In three months, they can speak German without accent. I, I'm always surprised about it, right? And people uh, with my age, they, they need a uh, uh, longer time, uh, more time to, to acquire the language. And I was thinking a lot why what they do better than us and i think there is something um about uh, nobody is talking um and it is when they came they play with other kids and they play with other uh, young people and they want to be part of of that uh, group to be accepted right to be part of the group and with when, when adult people come here to Germany, in my case, we have usually a huge cultural shock. And our first impression is, that's not my culture. It, we are really different. And then it's really difficult to try to understand that I need the language to be part of them. Um, I don't know. What do you think about it? But I think uh, this sense of, how do you say that? Belonging, belonging um, okay. is yeah. essential when you want to acquire the language. You need to feel that you need the language to be part of some new culture. And one mistake of, um, of language learning is you try to, uh, I mean, people try to learn the language, but they are not trying to learn the culture. And I think we need to understand first the culture. Why, why are they so uh, to, to be able to, to talk like them? Uh, what, what do you think about it? Well, I think uh, because I teach English, it's very different in, in that English is a, the international language. Yeah. So it's, um, although it's important for a learner who probably is going to live in an English speaking country to also learn the culture mm. of that country, many of my students uh, just want to be able to integrate into a multicultural mm. uh, working environment, usually. So I I'm not sure, of course, if it's uh, someone wanting to live uh, in, a, in, a in a language or in a country with one language, they absolutely need the cultural side as well. Mm. For English, it's a bit, it's a bit gray, actually. It depends mm. on what their objectives are. Yeah. I, I would uh, chime in on that. First of all, the, the one, the big advantage that a child has, let's say a Spanish speaking child who moves to Germany, they have a massive amount of input because they're interacting with their friends at school or wherever. And typically the immigrant adult doesn't get that amount of, of input. Uh, in Canada, where we see hockey players who come here from different uh, countries, like Russia, for example, if, I've often made this comparison. If you, get, if you go and find a Russian professor at university and then find a Russian professional hockey player, the hockey player is gonna speak English, at least insofar as pronunciation and 
his casual ability to use the language far superior to the professor at the university because the hockey player is on a team. He's playing with his teammates. He wants mm -hmm. to be part of that team. Mm -hmm. So it's just a natural thing. He just imbibes it. Mm -hmm. uh, whereas the professor is kind of, maybe he has friends amongst the expats. I don't know. But the other thing is when we use the word culture, we want to be, I think we need to be a little careful. There is a tendency, especially in beginner books in different languages, Korean or Japanese or whatever, they begin by introducing heavy culture. You know, here is this festival and here are the names we use for my mother's aunt and my, my father's, uh, you know, mother-in-law and, and all kinds of stuff that's sort of connected to the culture at some level, but which is so foreign and, and so unfamiliar that in fact it discourages the learner. At least that's been my reaction to it. I think what, what I understand, like when we talk about, say, an immigrant in a country, say Germany or immigrants to Canada, just wanting to be with that other group mm. and, and not feeling a sense of either that you're rejected or that you mm. resist them. You just want to be with them because when you, when you learn their language, you're imitating their culture. Just by, just by speaking, learning their language, you're imitating a part of their culture. So the more you're willing to feel that you're a part of that culture, even if you never go there, uh, the better you're going to do. So so I think to that extent, that's why the children who aren't hung up about their culture of origin and, uh, you know, they just kind of play with kids and absorb the language and, and imitate what they hear and they, they just, it's natural to them. So Steve, are you saying that probably for an adult, having a childlike um, attitude toward lear towards learning language would be very helpful? Because I think as adults, we are a bit more maybe introverted we although we want to get involved and be part of the community the new community whatever that might be we're always afraid of making mistakes being misjudged not belonging blah 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 whereas the child doesn't have the younger we are probably we have less of these inhibitions or uh, constraints so it is the learner's yeah. attitude will be i'm just going to go there and and then try and belong and hopefully be a uh, accepted as well yeah absolutely uh, because when we learn a language we change and as we get older we're more resistant to change mm -hmm. but uh, acquiring another language is it changes us and so i think a lot of adults are resistant to change and, and even a small thing like uh, for a portuguese speaker to learn spanish or vice versa in some it's easy because the vocabulary is like 95 percent the same and the grammar is 95 percent the same but it's so difficult for the Spanish speaker to leave his Spanish pronunciation and, and pronounce the way he's supposed to pronounce in Portuguese. Because that Spanish pronunciation is part of who he is. And so, whereas someone from some other language is not hung up uh, about whether he's Spanish speaking or Portuguese speaking. So there are a lot of psychological reasons why adults hang back in their own culture, their own identity. They don't want to change. Whereas the kids don't have that problem. Yeah, that's a big advantage for them, yeah. I would like to use the keyword uh, personality to mm, maybe add another idea. I think the problem is always that we start with some external content that is not connected with ourselves. So I have seen it in multiple courses that there are adults sitting there treated like a tabula rasa, like they, yeah. they are nobody, they have no profession, they have no cultural background, no experience, nothing. They feel like idiots because they start German with A1. Maybe they speak eight other languages. They are, I don't know, uh, surgeons. They have so much experience. So they are, as, as persons, they are so interesting, but they're treated like idiots because now they have to learn ABC in German. And that, that is tough for them because after Arabic, uh, try learning German. It's it's really tough. Mm. So the problem is, I think, um, the people always learn something that is important to them. So the, the first sentences should be, how can I describe myself? How can I talk about what is interesting to me or what is important to me? For example, when I started learning Spanish, the first thing I wanted my Mexican uh, teacher to tell me were jokes. Because without humor, uh, it, it's not me. <laughs> if I can't make jokes, if I can't, you know, make wordplays or something, I just, it doesn't feel right. So what about this personal, per, yeah, person, 
<laughs> if you adjust the learning to the person, I can't pronounce the word. So um, what do you think about that? So there shouldn't be a general structure of the language or general content. We should try to to adjust the stuff to the to the people, to the students, no matter how old or young they are. What do you think? Yes, uh, I'm afraid I fully agree. <laughs> I know you want some disagreement. <laughs> no, I can context. disagree. Okay, but uh, okay, we'll go to Stephen. Context no, is no, everything, no. Uh, and it's like, yeah, if you're not interested in in the topic, in the content, again, we're going back to there is no motivation, there is no uh, interest in, in in learning a series of words and sentences that you're never ever ever going to use. What is the point? So content and context is everything. Hmm. Yeah, I think um, maybe one kind of solution is try with personal teachers. And there are some platforms where you can book a lesson, but you choose the topic, you choose the, the teacher, and you can uh, review, how do you say, uh, read the, the material before the lesson. And also you can change the teacher if you don't like him or something, right? So if you make the language school, um, if you adjust the language school to the, the person, you are improving uh, this, the language uh, learning system uh, that we have now in these um, big rooms with 30 students and the, the teacher are talking all the time and you hear, you listen these old tapes uh, where you can't understand nothing. Um, so I think the, the, the digital, um, how do you say, uh, that uh, time uh, that we have now it's a good tool to uh, improve the language system. Yeah, the problem is yeah, I, platform don't exist anymore. We don't have italki or something. Okay, we have to okay, reinvent okay. them, remember? Okay, okay, okay. I, I, I would uh, uh, just, uh, I didn't, dis I don't disagree with, uh, with Maria that we need to, you know, personalize the instruction. But uh, I'm very much a proponent of input to get started because it's very difficult to have a conversation until you have a certain level of vocabulary and until you can understand what the other person is saying. And it takes a fair amount of work to get there. Now, it depends on preferences. Some people like speaking right away. I don't. And I like, I prefer, and I think the issue is that, that in this new language instruction world, I think the role of the teacher is to find content, learning content, provide a, a range of, of choice to the learner and, and have content. Uh, to me, beginner content has to have a lot of repetition in it. And uh, it, that's often the problem with some of these teach yourself and others that the vocabulary, there's not an awful lot of repetition throughout the system. There has to be a lot of repetition for beginner material. And of course, authentic material such as Netflix and YouTube newspapers. There's an abundance of that stuff, podcasts. Another thing that's lacking is the sort of intermediate content. And intermediate content is very difficult because uh, sort of word frequency declines so quickly so that in your you know, beginner material, you can actually cover the most frequent thousand words. Uh, but to get from there to the genuinely authentic material, it takes a long time because words that you need are gonna show up once every 30 pages or so. And so I think, uh, but it turns out that sort of natural conversation is easier because it uses, you know, the less difficult words. So I think in our ideal scenario, we would get people to talk to each other and record themselves and transcribe this, but just casual conversations that people can use as that sort of intermediate level. And if it's a natural conversations, people are just talk to, talking to each other or about each other, I think that's quite interesting to people because it allows them to enter into the culture. What does an average person in Iran, you know, think? What are their preoccupations? You know, uh, that rather than the whatever festival they have, but day-to-day -day life 
I think is of interest to people in the different languages. Yeah. Yes, I agree. I mean, at the intermediate level, it, I think shared experiences are the most important thing. You know, the beginners mm -hmm. need a certain set of vocabulary. Advanced, they can do anything they like. Intermediate, it's more limited. But like you're saying, I mean, all of us are human beings. We have so many shared areas of experience that I think we need to just focus on those rather than get too flowery and read newspapers. It's that it, 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 it is frustrating for them. So yeah, I agree there with Steve. So when, when my students or my followers on YouTube ask me uh, what content they should watch, what, what lessons they should watch, I say, why don't you try entering um, any community on Facebook, for example, uh, which deals with stuff you're interested in? So you, you're into fitness. Wonderful. Go to a German speaking group of uh, fitness lovers or gardening lovers or dog Hard lovers or whatsoever. <laughs> so because what they do, they, they go to all possible groups where uh, German learners or any language learners are together. And uh, so basically they exchange mistakes because they are all learning. And this is the traditional situation uh, they used to have in the past in schools when there is one teacher who speaks hopefully proper language and uh, the rest are students who have all to learn from this one person, which is crazy. So we, we could maybe mix really native speakers and learners, which is in, in the online um, world really possible and it, it's not a problem at all, but the thinking is still old. So if I want to learn a language, I go and find teaching content or learning content. I don't just use something that I'm interested in in this language. So for example, um, I can now uh, object and say, I don't like adapted materials. So if people uh, at the level of B1 ask me, what should I read on the level of B1? I say, buy a bestseller in two languages, one that you know and the target language, and then just try reading uh, a page in the language you understand and a page in the language you learn. And you will finally uh, have a feeling that you understand more than translating every word because the adapted books are terrible. Or we, we, but actually, if they disappeared overnight, we have to make new books. So what do you think? Adapted, uh, Maria, you mean like easy readers? Uh, yes, no, yes, yes. So uh, abridged. All uh, right. So you, you, you don't like those. You think they're a bit... Why, why you don't like it? Because they are, uh, I don't know, they, they don't have anything. I tried reading something in English. I guess it was Stevenson uh, Treasure Island. Is it called like that? Treasure. It was... It was not the text uh, that it used to be. I mean, they removed all the historic <laughs> world or words, anything that is not mm. understandable to now mm. modern young readers. So basically, they removed everything. It was a castrated text and it didn't have any atmosphere of that time because Stevenson didn't write it in 2020. I mean, it's, it's been a while. Uh, or, or Alice in Wonderland tried to remove all the language jokes from the text. It's not Alice in Wonderland anymore. There is no point reading it. So mm. you're trying, they might as well write a new modern story in, in simple terms, rather than take a classic and mm, mangle it like that. I guess it would be more productive. More productive, yeah. <laughs> you know, it's interesting. I, I have to agree uh, with Maria. I don't like, uh, you know, easy, like, abridged versions or simplified versions of well-known books like when i was into russian in six months i was reading Tolstoy, and i wouldn't have wanted to read it in a simplified version what you can do is and what i'm sort of disappointed that there isn't more of is non-fiction for example i had a lady in iran do a series for us at link on the history of iran she tells it very simply the history of iran and after every five minute episode there's 25 episodes then she has these circling questions where she makes a statement, she asks a question about it, and then she answers it. And all you do is listen. You don't have to try to remember anything. But so you take something that is nonfiction and you simplify it. I think that is a much better solution than simplifying 
you know, Balzac, so people can read Balzac in simplified French. I would never do that. Uh, mm. One other quickie. Uh, you mentioned, Maria, how difficult it is for an Arabic speaker to learn German. How about for an English speaker to learn Arabic? Okay, I that's difficult. That. It's, it's as crazy. <laughs> but one thing that is available to us now, and I just described this very briefly to you. So I, I'm listening to podcasts on Al Jazeera. I am able to get them transcribed at an automatic transcription service that costs me $10 a month and I get like, I don't know, 12 hours of transcription. It's very accurate. The punctuation is off, they miss the odd word, but it's 95% accurate. So now I have this transcript of a 25 minute podcast with lots of unknown words. But then I can import that into link with timestamps because Happy Scribe offers you the option to import with timestamps. So now I can go through chunks of text I can listen to that chunk while reading in English even, because Google Translate gives you an English translation of that. And then I can go through and pick out the words that I need to learn, look them up in an online dictionary. So you break that 25 minute th thing down into chunks where you can hear the audio, you can, and it's quite effective actually to hear the audio and read in your own language. I'm at a stage in Arabic where it's too difficult for me to understand just listening, okay? So at, for my stage, that is another way to introduce a sort of an intermediate type of content which is nevertheless authentic but which is digestible and i think we need to look at different ways that we can use modern technology uh you know google translate text to speech uh you know automatic transcription which is a form of ai uh podcasts and all these different things to bring the world of language to our to our learners steve there is a question in the chat uh, which uh, yeah. transcription program you're using Ha uh, happyscribe.com. I tried a number of them. I tried a number of them two, three years ago. They were terrible. I gave up. Uh, for a while, I had to pay someone in Morocco to transcribe these, but that gets pretty expensive pretty quickly. Uh, <laughs> I wrote to, uh, to Al Jazeera for permission to share those with our members at Link and never get an answer. So mm -hmm. now I go to this automatic transcription service and it's very good. I compared them to, you know, uh, man, like woman, produce transcripts and they were like 98% accurate. So happyscribe.com works very well for me. And they have, they offer you the chance to, to get timestamps so you can match it to the audio. Yeah. That sounds awesome. But that also brings me to the idea that we should then more listen to polyglots and people who are, uh, it doesn't matter how many languages you speak well, but who, who are experienced in learning languages. Because what people used to have in the past is language teachers uh, who were, yeah, who learned how to teach a language. They, they were taught how to teach it. So how to structureize, which methods to use. But how many language teachers do you know who didn't actually speak any language properly? I mean, mm -hmm. and this is a disaster, I think. So we have so many people who are talented or uh, experienced both in learning languages. So why don't we just ask them? And I guess for students at school, it would be also much more interesting to learn languages if they could uh, maybe access a database with all possible videos and, and tips and advice, whatever, from people who can actually do it. I think that is kind of obvious. Yeah. What do you think? Yeah. I think part of the, just quickly, part of the problem is that teachers are trained in the language. So the teacher becomes the source of wisdom about the language, the grammar structure and so forth. Maybe teachers should spend more time looking at all the different ways of learning. So even if the person doesn't speak 10 languages, they could help learners learn 10 languages. You don't have to be a native speaker in all these languages, but you have to be aware of what is out there that can help the learner. Mm. Yeah. Yes. I guess the, the passion is always an important thing because I can imagine there can be a teacher who is perfectly professional but doesn't share this passion of learning languages and that can kill any motivation that maybe had existed in the beginning but if they're like, um, okay, I have to pass on the language but I don't really care about it, I just need the money. So I would include some very uh, complicated testing for teachers, which would include some kind of psychological, I don't know, testing, and uh, they'd have to say why. Why is it really? Why do you have to teach the language? Why 
does it have to be you? Mm. Well, that's probably brutal. No, it's not. No, you're right. You're right. And uh, I suppose the first thing is how many other languages do you speak or have you tried to learn? That's, mm. that's really important. It doesn't they yes. don't need to necessarily be fluent in many languages, but at least they need to have had the experience of, a, of being a student. So um, otherwise, you're right. They don't. That they is true. Have to but I'm afraid, I mean, we, we could talk here for hours, I think, but I'm afraid <laughs> our time is basically up. So it, it almost hurts to say, but I, I have to let you go. Um, many thanks for this wonderful conversation. I guess many interesting ideas um, came into the world today. And I hope uh, tomorrow's world of learning languages will be better with our help. So thank you very much to my interlocutors so to to it was a pleasure talking to you and see you another time thank see you another time thank you very much it's been a pleasure thank you